the Laird of Morphy and the Water Kelpie. There once was a Scottish laird whose name was Graham of Morphy, and, as he was rich and great, he determined to build himself a grand castle. Perhaps, because being rich, he was somewhat miserly, and he did not like the thought of having to pay a great deal of money for the building of it. So he hit on a plan by which he thought he could get labour cheaply. And this was the plan. Down in the valley, close to where he lived, there was a large deep loch, and in the loch, so the country folk said, there dwelt a water kelpie. Now, water kelpies, as all the world knows, are cruel and malicious spirits who love nothing better than to lure mortals to destruction. And this is how they say about it. They take the form of a beautiful chestnut horse and come out of the water all saddled and bridled, as if ready to be mounted. Then they graze quietly by the side of the road until some luckless creature is tempted to get on their back. Then they plunge with him into the water and he is no more seen. At least so the old folk say, for I have never met one of these creatures myself. To go on with the story, however, the Laird of Morphy knew that the water kelpie who haunted the loch in his property was in the habit of coming out the water in the gloaming in the way I have described, and grazing quietly by the roadside. And as he knew also that these uncanny horses were very strong, he determined to gain the mastery over one, and force it to do his work. And the only way to do this was to take off the magic bridle which it wore, and put it on again. No very easy task. The Laird of Morphy, however, was a man who did not know what fear meant, and he was quite certain that he would be able to conquer the Kelpie. So one evening he took down his sword from the wall, and calling to his wife, told her that he was in need of a servant, and that he thought the water horse would make a very good one, so he was going out to master him. Only, he added, I cannot do it without your help, so listen to what I tell you. You must go out into the garden, and pluck two twigs from the rowan tree that grows by the gate, and fashion them into a cross, and put it up over the outside of the door, which you must bar and bolt. That will keep the creature from entering the house, for no evil spirit can endure the rowan wood, let alone the holy sign. Then you must open the kitchen window, for although I want to keep the kelpie out, I myself need to get in. Do you understand? But if the laird was not afraid of water horses, his wife was, and instead of answering him, she threw her arms around his neck and wept bitterly and begged and besought him not to meddle with spirits, but to bide quietly at home. Which, of course, he would not agree to do, and he pushed the poor woman away from him roughly, told her not to be a fool, but to attend to his words and do his bidding. Then he went out and left her, and she was so terrified that she went at once and picked round twigs and made a cross of them, and put it up outside the door. Then she shut herself into the house and opened the kitchen window, exactly as her husband had told her to do. After which she crept away to her bed and hid her head below the blankets. Meanwhile, the laird walked boldly down the road, until he came to a place where it ran between two hills, and was out of sight of any house. And in this lonely spot he saw, as he had expected, a fine chestnut horse nibbling the sweet short grass by the roadside. It carried a saddle and bridle of the finest leather, and it looked so quiet and docile that it might have been a lady's palfrey. The lady was not misled by its looks, however. As he approached it, he drew his sword, and when he came up to it, he suddenly struck it a sharp rap on the side of the head, completely severing the strap which held its bridle in position. The creature, taken by surprise, reared high in the air, and seeing that there was no chance of temp tempting this cautious mortal to climb on its back, was turning to gallop down the loch when its bridle fell from its neck to the ground. In a moment the laird had picked it up and put it into his pocket, for he knew that when a water horse lost its bridle, its power was gone, and that it could not go back to its watery abode until it found it again. No sooner had he done so than, to his astonishment, the creature began to talk like any mortal, and to beg him to give it back his bridle, reminding him that it had never in its life done him any harm. 
I cannot thank you for that, said the laird dryly, for methinks had I once been fool enough to mount on your back, we would soon have seen whether you would have done me harm or no. Aha, my bonny nag, I have your bridle safe in my pocket, and I think I had better keep it there. Then the water horse grew angry and showed his teeth in a way that would have frightened most men. You will never set foot in your own house, he said, till you have given me back my bridle, for I can travel quicker than you can, and I will go and take possession of it. With these words he galloped off in the direction of the laird's house, but the laird only laughed and followed at his leisure, for he knew that no spirit, be it witch or warlock or demon, could enter a dwelling that was guarded by the cross of Rowan. And he was right, for when he reached home, he found the water horse standing stock still in front of the door, apparently determined that, since it could get no further, it would at least prevent the owner of the house entering. But as we know, the kitchen window was open, and the laird went round the back of the house and jumped in at that. Then he went upstairs and put his head out of one of the upper windows and began to bargain with the kelpie. See here, he said, you're very anxious to get your bridle back, for without it you are helpless and must remain for the remainder of your life on land. I, on my side, have a castle to build, and I need a good strong horse to cart the stones. So if you'll promise to do that for me, I will promise when you're finished to give you back your bridle. And as there seemed no other way, the water horse agreed to the bargain. Now, if the kelpie were naturally cruel, I'm afraid the laird was cruel also, for he loaded the poor beast with such heavy loads that its shoulders were often chafed and bleeding, and it grew thin and miserable looking. Indeed, he worked it so hard that it was almost dead by the time the castle was completed. Then, as he had no further use for it, he gave it back his bridle, and told it that it could go back to where it had come from. Alas, he did not know what he had laid up in store for himself and his family, for the water kelpie, enraged at the sufferings which he had been made to endure, looked over his shoulder as it was about to plunge into the law, and solemnly uttered these words. Sair back and sair banes, driven the laird of Morphy's stains, the laird of Morphy I'll never thrive as long as a kelpie is alive. And his words came only too true, for one misfortune after another fell on the laird and his descendants, until at last his name died out altogether. So by this token, let all those who hear this story learn that it is never wise to persecute anybody, not even a water kelpie. The end. Don't forget to like and subscribe and press the wee bell notification. And a huge big thank you to all my subscribers and patrons. See you next week. Bye bye.